do you believe in the teachings of Jesus, the, the, the uber prophecy, the ultimate prophecy that Jesus gave in Matthew's gospel, chapter 24, that is commonly referred to as the tribulation? It is a tribulation. Jesus himself called it the tribulation. And having said that, uh, do you believe that what's happening now in Afghanistan is the beginning, beginning of a global holy war? There are a couple of things I think we need to be mindful of about why uh, Afghanistan fell so quickly after $2.2 trillion had been spent trying to build the Afghan forces, some 350,000 fighting forces with tanks and with jets and all kinds of other implements of destruction. Why? Afghanistan as a nation fell within a couple of days. And the reason being is this, is that the Taliban, the Taliban are ready to fight to the death. They, has a re they have a reason to fight. They, they're fighting for their religious beliefs. They're fighting for their culture. They're fighting for their God. They're fighting for their place in spiritual history. They are willing to die for what they believe in. They're willing to die. They are willing, the Taliban though there are only 75,000 forces or so, they're willing to die for what they believe in. The Afghan forces, on the other hand, some 350,000 strong backed by America with American hardware, fighter jets, helicopters, tanks, trucks, implements, and a fat payroll as a soldier from America, those Afghan soldiers fight because they get paid, but they're not willing to die. And that makes a difference. Always remember that. People who are willing to die for what they believe, you know, <laughs> you decide to choose a fight with them. Make sure you're willing to die as well. Now, of course, I don't know if you remember the great statements by General Patton, who stated to his soldiers in battle in World War II, you know, don't die for your country. Make the other soldier die for his. However, do we now see, and I want you to come up close because I want you to hear me clearly. Are we now pro prophetically looking at a global holy war? You know, the Muslims, though I don't know who brought down the World Trade Center in, on 9-11, but the Muslims, and this is global knowledge, are well capable of a jihad and a guerrilla-type warfare that was first started, by the way, by Abraham. Abraham of the Bible, remember him? That they are more capable of a global warfare with sleeper cells, jihadist tactics all over the world, especially in Western world and in JFIF communities, JFIF countries and nations. Are we on the precipice now of a holy war? Now that the energy has been fed into the jihadist and to the uh, Taliban and to Muslims worldwide who see America and Europe as the great Satan, are we on the precipice of a global holy war that all of the jets and atomic bombs that America and Israel and everybody else has cannot defeat. The way that America got their butts kicked in Afghanistan, that that is now a paradigm of jihadists for a holy war in every Western, Japheth, Christian, and Jewish capital. Do you believe that? Well, first of all, do you believe in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, uh, verse 5 and 6, where Jesus says there'll be wars and rumors of wars? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Then you don't have to believe the jihadists. You don't have to believe me. But if you believe Jesus, then potentially we are on the precipice of a global holy war now that the Taliban has been able to defeat the so-called great Satan of the West. Let me say some other things to you, historically and intellectually, if you don't mind my using such descriptions. Islam, that is a religion that the Taliban belongs to in Afghanistan, is seated in, is the last great authentic religion. It's a, actually a seventh century religion 
that was founded just 1,300 years ago. It's a new, it's a baby compared to Judaism. And, you know, it's 600, 700 years younger than Christianity. It's, it's 2,000 a years younger than 2,000 years younger than Buddhism and 5,000 years younger than, uh, than Hinduism. It's a baby religion. Islam is a baby on the world stage of religion. It's a, it got started in the 7th sixth, 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 century. One of those, I'll check it. And Muhammad, the Hashemite, right, says that God called him from the place where Solomon's temple was built that Jesus had torn down in the 6th century. God called him, Muhammad, was there minding his business, into heaven one night. And some angels came and took him, took him ish, uh, to, to heaven um, and, and talked to him. And he talked to God. He talked to the prophets. He took that flight from the, what we now refer to in Israel as the Dome of the Rock. Actually, it was a place where the temple of Solomon had been built. But you remember that Jesus declared in Matthew's gospel, chapter 24, starting at verse 1 and following, that the temple that Solomon built that was rebuilt by Herod the Great would be torn down and there'd not be one stone upon another. I was in Israel recently, and there's one place on the west wall they call the Wailing Wall. But the place where Solomon, now listen to this very carefully. This is very, very carefully. Listen to this very, very carefully. This is very carefully. The place where Solomon built the original temple and where Herod rebuilt it after the returning Jews with Ezra and Nehemiah and then Herod the Great built it during the time just before the birth of Jesus. Jesus tore that temple down. 600 years later, there's nothing there. 600 years later, in the 6th century, there's nothing there. A prophet, a Hashemite named Mohammed is sitting there on what is referred to as Mount Moriah, where the temple was. And he said, God called him. That God called him to heaven and sent some angels to carry him into heaven. Now, on that place where Solomon built that temple, is now called the Dome of the Rock. And you've seen the pictures of the al Aska Mosque, that gold dome, where Solomon's temple used to be is now the temple of Muslims, and it's been there for several years now. Islam is the, 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 a baby religion compared to Judaism. But look at its forces. Muhammad is a, perhaps one of the youngest of the, of, the, of, the, of the last prophets. But he took his flight from where Solomon's temple was, and Jesus is the one that said that the temple should be shown torn down. That dome of the rock right there that you see, that's El Aska Mosque. And right where Solomon's temple used to be, where the Jews used to have their temple, where the temple was in the days of Jesus, where the temple that Jesus went has been torn down by Jesus, and the dome, this Muslim temple, has replaced it. And Jesus said he was going to tear, tear down the Jewish temple. Now, of course, you know a little bit more history here of Israel that the... Um, Israel had been, the whole nation had been a wasteland for many, many years after the great diaspora of tearing down the temple in 70 AD when Rome came in and tore down the temple and the Jews fled and everybody and Paul and Peter both executed and it remained vacant for several hundred years as Christianity spread to Asia Minor and not so much in Jerusalem. But there was a small kingdom and there came a, a, a if you will, in the ninth century, a fighter by the name of Saladin, who was a Muslim boy. And he took Jerusalem by force. And, it's, and pretty much they've held it ever since. Richard the Lionhearted came in, but he never was able to retake, recapture the temple. A Jerusalem, a city of Jerusalem. So if you go to Jerusalem today, it's a divided city. You got the, East, got the, you got the West Bank. You got the Palestinian division or the Muslim division, and you got. But the the point I want to point out to to all of you who have your blinders on 
is that Jesus tore down Solomon's temple and has allowed Muhammad's temple to stand, called the Dome of the Rock. He tore down Solomon's temple and said he's going to tear it down in the book of Jeremiah. Jesus said he's going to tear it down in, 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 uh, in, in, in Matthew 24. But the temple of the, of, the, of the Dome of the Rock remains standing. You know, Marsha Diane, the Six-Day War, one of the most incredible victories in the history of fighting, which brings me back to my subject matter. Are we now on the precipice of a jihadist holy war everywhere you find Western civilization? We'll see. We will see. But Moshe Dayan, one of, one of Israel's greatest generals, Moshe Dayan, in the Six-Day War, took what uh, Richard the Lionhearted could not do with Saladin. Richard the Lionhearted, Moshe Dayan was able in the Six-Day War, in the fighting with some 22 Arab nations, defeat all 22 of them, was able to retake the Dome of the Rock. He was able to retake Temple Mount. But you know what he did? Moshe Diane, you know what he did? He, and you can, I, you can say Almighty God told him to do it. But the Jews to this very day are confounded that Moshe Diane, who was general of over the armed forces and at that point very influential as prime minister of the, of, the, of the nation of Israel, told the Muslim they could keep the Dome of the Rock. He would not tear it down. It remains a sacred ground. And you know, no Jew can walk on that dome of the rock. You know, there have been several, there have been uh, General Sharon um, and others have tried to go up to the dome of the rock and the Muslim has driven up and on. It, it is the, one of the most contested pieces of property on the planet. One of the most contested. But Moshe Dayan, who was a decorated, very powerful Israeli general said to the to the Muslims, "You can keep it. We're not going because they had, the Muslims have been had been defeated in the Six Day War, and Moshe Dayan could have torn that te, the, the dome of the rock. He could have torn it down, or at the very least, at the very least, banned any Muslim for ever entering it again. He didn't. He told them you can keep it and continue to worship there to this very day. That's going back oh what seventy years now." The most contested parcel of land on the planet is this area right here where Solomon's temple used to be. Can we, do we assume that God now favors Muslims over Jews? Let's back up a minute because I know how y'all get all in a hissy fit. Listen, Jesus said he's going to tear down the temple, not James David Manning. I didn't say that I'm going to tear down the Sol Solomon's temple. I didn't say that. Jesus said he's going to tear down Solomon's temple. And he tore it down. The Romans came in in 70 AD and tore that thing to smithereens twice. Does Jesus now favor the Dome of the Rock being in that holy place rather than Solomon's temple or some Christian church? I don't, I'm not saying, yes, he does. I'm asking you to pray about it and think about it because I'm asking you a larger question. Are we now going to see as a result of the fall of Afghanistan the Muslim beat the British in a 100-year contest. They beat the Soviet Union in an 11-year contest. They defeated America in a 20-year contest. Are we now going to see a global jihadist event rise out of this defeat of America in Afghanistan? You know, the loss of Jerusalem was also um, a, a loss of uh, of the Temple Mount was a loss of the authority of the Jews to really, uh, even though they, you know, they have been able to maintain Gaza and use the Palestinian, if you will, but uh, issues in terms of uh, religious and social identities. I don't know how much longer this is going to last. And I can tell you this: that perhaps Islam, you know, will defeat Christianity because Muslims that our Muslims call America the great Satan of the West. They see America and Christianity as satanic. I simply raised a question to you today. But the portends and the fallout of this, this, this unprecedented defeat of America in Afghanistan under the Biden administration would be one of the most historical defeats of any nation at any time. It will become the new Waterloo 
cabal will become the new Waterloo when you study battles across the ages. Me, I want to reach out to my Muslim brothers. I want to reach out to them to righteousness. I want to say to them, Allah, not Allah, but Allah, Allah, Allah. It's going to be my prayer call. My call to Juma. Allah! To my Muslim brothers. Come to righteousness. Come to righteousness. Allah! My Juma call. I'm James David Manning, everybody. I'm the Lord servant. I want to ask you to come up close for just one second. And I, I want to talk to three year and older veterans of the uh, Trust in Lord Hour, uh, the Open Rewards Prayer Meeting, the Manor Report, and the Pulpit of Power, those four ministries that we do every week, uh, producing at least 20 different ministries or sermons every week. If you are a three year or older veteran, by old I mean four years, five years, six years, seven years, 10 years, 12 years uh, old veteran of of any of these ministries that we do on a daily basis every week, and you are not a supporter, you've not joined with the uh, the ministry to give your uh, to pledge your support and your alignment with what we've been teaching. I and I, my question is why? I, you've had three years to observe us. You've had three years to listen to us on a daily basis, all weekend, all day long, any hour of the day. We're uh, broadcasting. Uh, you've had three years to watch our various successes. You've three years to watch our ups and downs. You've had three years to listen to the tenor or the consistency of what we have said, whether we are consistent or whether we are all over the chart and what we do and what we believe. You've had three years to watch people around us who have made the commitment to join with our ministry and church and to financially support it. And by the way, I want to give another shout out to Brother Jesse Munez out there in San Bernardino, along with uh, uh, Goldfinger, who is just extraordinary giver, and others that do extraordinary uh, giving to our ministry. My question is to you, if you are a three-year veteran or older, why haven't you joined? Why haven't you committed? And I suppose some of the reasons would say, well, Pastor, man, I belong to another church. And uh, why? How could you, how could you, after three years of hearing me teach about the Sabbath, about righteousness, about the tribulation, and listen to me faithfully as you do, and still go sit up in another pastor's face? How could you be? It's like you, it's like a woman sleeping with two men. You know, one she likes during the week and the other she likes on the weekend. It is it's hypocritical. Um, how could you do that? I mean, as I say, you started three months ago. I can understand why it may take you some time to evaluate. It may take you some time to look at me, to discover you know, who I am. You say, well, pastor, that's not that I don't belong to another church or ministry. I, I, you, I'm with you. But there's some things you say I like, and there's some things you say I don't like. Why? Why is it that some, you, you've made a decision that there's some things that, I, that you don't like are stronger than the things that you do like. I, you know, I am not a psychiatrist, but I am an analyst. And I have to tell you, I analyze the world and our understanding. But the understanding and wisdom tells me this, that if there are things that a person such as myself that I am saying, there, there is no room to disagree with what I am saying, unless your purpose is to find something to disagree with. Let's say, for instance, you say, well, I like the fact that you talk about Obama, but I don't like the fact that you talk about Trump. Let's say, for instance, you're one of those, right? Well, the purpose, it isn't that you, it isn't that you just like what I say about Obama, but don't like what I say about Trump. What it is, is that you are looking for a reason to support Trump. It isn't that you don't like it. It's just that you don't like the fact that I'm saying something about it. It isn't that what I'm saying is wrong. Let me put it that way. It isn't what I'm saying is wrong or indifferent. You know it's right. But you have, you've lived your life or you've come up or you've been raised with a doctrine that you can really live in a false reality. That's where you are. You've been raised in a doctrine that you can live in a false reality. That is to say, 
you can like the truth about Obama, but you don't like the truth about Trump. And it's the same truth. It's the same truth. There's no difference. But because you have been indoctrinated to live in a false reality, you are really a person who needs psychological debriefing. And, and, but trust me, there are zillions of people around the world who live that way. I, there, there are people who know what I'm saying about Trump. Obama is right. They know it. But they choose to ignore it based on the fact that they find a reality that isn't true and they've settled in there. Say, so that's one of the reasons why I've not made a commitment because, you know, I, I, I don't like, the fact, I wish you would support what I support. But the, the truth of the matter is, then why do you come? You've given three years or more of your life to listen to me? Three years of your life? To listen to me, and you know you, and you're not tired of listening to me yet. And you've given three years of your life, and over the past three years, your life has been greatly upgraded. You've learned, you've been educated, you've been enlightened. And let me say this to you: if you make the commitment, say, well, Pastor, I'm joining with you, and I'm going to support. I'm going to do the tithe and offering. I'm going to do the first fruit. I'm going to keep the Sabbath. Your life is going to soar. Now, listen to me very carefully. Now, I'm not going to leave you alone after this. Listen to me very carefully. You come as often as you come over the past three years because you're being helped. You're being educated. You're being enlightened. Right? Right. But the thing that you like, whether you, you say, well, I like what you say about Obama, but I don't like what you say about Trump. You do the same thing with the word of God, such as you like the things I say, the teachings that I say, the way I explain the Bible, the way I break it all down and make it clear. But when it comes to things like money or tithing and offering or the Sabbath, well, that you know is also true, but because of your false reality, because you really need a psychological debriefing, because of your false reality, you choose not to believe the tithe or the first fruit or the Sabbath. Now, it isn't that it isn't true. It's just true in all the other things I've said. But you live in a false reality where you, avoid, you try to ignore the truth about the tithe. And so you don't do it. But, it, that is the, but the, everything else I say is good to go. Everything I ever say is good to go. Good enough to share with your friends. It makes you laugh. It educates you. It enlightens you. But the tithe? Well... And the full commitment to the ministry, well, the first fruit offerings, well, the Sabbath. But that's all true as well. But you have chosen and you've been raised and indoctrinated to have a dual reality, which is dangerous. Jesus said this, and I'll leave you. He said, I would rather you be the hot or cold, but not lukewarm. You're lukewarm. You have a dual reality. He said, if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. I would rather you be completely stomped down against Pastor Manny, trying to, dis trying to take him down. Be fully against him. Be against him with all of your strength. Or be fully for him with all of your strength. But don't be in the middle somewhere lukewarm. You're, you're better than to be spit out of the mouth of Jesus if you're lukewarm. So what's it going to be? You're going to make the commitment and grow and be even greatly better blessed or you're going to continue to walk in the lukewarm spit of the mouth of the Savior. I'm James David Manning, everybody. I'm the Lord's servant.